Pedro de Casa, welcome back to FACE. Thank you so much, Dale. Nice to see Great you. Great to have you. Great to have you here, Pedro. So uh, I guess I'll share my screen. You want to use cameras? Doesn't matter to me. We Doesn't don't have matter. To. We can do it if you want. I'm here. I'm ready. I'm, All right. Well, okay. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Let me just uh, get a little light in here. Because I do want to talk about your recent, uh, your most recent article, Pedro. Absolutely. And, you know, so uh, let me just get back up here. So uh, you sent it to me the other day, and I think it's going to be an important issue. So tell me what your take is. Uh, so we have another mandate by a central bank that may be causing global financial market instability, that stability is uh, separate uh, compared to rates to maintain it. Um, do you think the BOE is maintaining financial stability? Uh, they're trying their darn best, but you know, it's, it looks, it's looking pretty dicey right now. And it's, uh, I'm really curious about how the week is going to end when they finally, uh, you know, when they try to pull out of that market. It doesn't seem like the market is quite functional there. Um, okay. But the 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 genesis of the article that you're showing really is basically the markets went from hunting, you know, the market is obsessed with the Fed pivot, as you know, because everybody knows that the big the big moment to make money is going to be when that, you know, when that turnaround happens. Right. And we went from trying to ascribe a potential pivot to various macroeconomic events. Uh, maybe the job market will slow down enough. Maybe a recession prospect will lead the Fed to to uh, to pause. But then the Fed pushed back against that hard, starting in Jackson Hole, and they've kept going. So, and then we had this financial instability coming from from England and and the Bank of England intervening. And then the question became in markets: Oh, okay. Well, it might we might not get a macro event that will dissuade the Fed, but surely financial instability will because that's the kind of thing that truly drives fed pivots right and the point of the story was to actually argue that the bar for the fed to intervene is still extremely high is that it's not that they would let markets crash uh but actually it is that they would let markets crash they simply wouldn't let markets become so dysfunctional that there's no pricing and that markets are completely frozen but it would essentially take a market freeze type of event whether it's in credit or in treasuries for the fed to actually intervene and even then they might not intervene at least not initially by pausing rate hikes they would try to intervene using their various uh special emergency lending facilities that they've you know that they've concocted in the past they can revive concocted, those. concocted. i like that <laughs> so uh, it's like making a cocktail it so, is, yeah. anyway so pedro uh you know tell me what's the difference between what gilts have been doing for a few years and what our treasury market has been doing for a few years um our gilts uh, that much more they were exacerbated and magnified for a few days because of um you know potential uh pension crisis uh are things really that different in the u.s where pension funds had to go out on the risk curve to get their seven eight percent and they're probably sitting on some coupons that uh, are discounted quite a bit from when they were buying them. Where's I don't have the difference. Enough, I don't have enough visibility to, to know how different it is, but my sense is that it's not that different, right? Because yeah, reach for yield behavior was global, and these pension right. funds likely behaved in the same way. So you know, we're never going to know. You know, nobody had UK pension funds on their bingo card for financial risks, right, for 2022. But here we are. So. I think I think we are now entering a new phase of this of this you know cycle, which is a, you know basically a financial crisis type phase, where we're going to get different types of events popping up here and there, and they're going to seem unrelated, and people are going to try to to portray them as local. But to your point, I don't think it is a local phenomenon. I think it's the first pipe to burst, if you will, okay. and in, in a global financial system that's kind of saturated with pressure right now and just kind of waiting to blow. Are we in a sovereign debt crisis? I'm not sure if it's a sovereign debt crisis or if it's a credit crisis. I'm not sure how we're going to end up characterizing it, but yeah. I think the UK is very close to a sovereign debt crisis. The US is different, of course, because you know people will pile into dollar assets as the world 
kind of collapses. And so that's the kind of the advantage that we have at least temporarily. But that, that doesn't mean that, you know, we also have liquidity problems in our own treasury market, even though it's supposed to be the most liquid, safest market in the world. So it doesn't mean that those problems aren't going to come home to roost over here. So my sense is that it's kind of a waiting game, but, uh, you know, we are going to have some kind of financial event here in the States as well. I just can't predict what form it's going to take. Okay. Uh, what do you make out of the gilts making new highs and, you know, the same day, uh, Bridge Pound was trading about 103 down here on the panic day, Pedro. And uh, even though gilts have made new lows, new highs and yields, there's been very little give back in the currency uh, because I was reading your friend and who you introduced me to, uh, a Fed guy. Yeah. And uh, he was saying that anytime a uh, government steps in and begins a bond buying program, that it leads to a weakening of the currency vis-a-vis -vis Japan with their yield curve control. So at least short term, that's not what's happening because uh, gilt made new lows without the pound, pound well above the lows of the panic. Um, any that's ideas right. about that, huh? I mean, I don't really. I think the market is just so dysfunctional at the moment that it's hard to, to read into into that level right. of detail, basically. Okay. Well, then, why don't we read into this? Do you think that it's time for um, the G19 at the IMF meeting this week to make some to have some type of communique uh, about the wrecking ball, the dollar, which I think is behind a lot of this. That perhaps if the dollar had not been as strong, yields may not have gone up as much in the UK. Um, they're higher than us. Uh, I was taught the BOE leads the Fed. Um, so couldn't they come in and intervene and, uh, you know, or at least talk up the dollar, jawbone it, and that might be a Band-Aid for, and they'd still have cover to raise rates because intervening against the, do uh, the dollar, which it's easier to bring your currency down than to lift it, right? Um, would give them cover because they could say it's for financial stability and continue on their right rate hiking path. That's a good point. The problem is I don't think we're there yet because the Fed doesn't see this as a crisis moment that's yet affecting the U.S. in the same way that I'm looking at it. They see it as something that's happening over there and our, and they think the, the Fed will say and officials that I talk to will say our, our mandate is domestic. And as long as nothing is broken here, we're not going to intervene. The other issue is that, you know, we're talking about different principles involved, right? We're talking about central banks versus the treasuries coming together and making that decision, which is, you know, a whole different ball game. So I don't expect that kind of verbal intervention just yet. Uh, okay. I don't think we're there yet. And people are talking about a new plaza accord, but I also, again, I don't think the dimension of the move, even though it's, it's large and it's, it's catastrophic for some emerging market countries. It's not yet at the magnitude, at least in the developed world, that it was when we got the Plaza Accords in the 80s. Well, I don't know. Uh, this type of decline in, in cable, this is not an emerging market currency. This well, is pretty close to a collapse, looking, right? No, you're right. And, uh, the, right. UK, I mean, and, and the Euro... Euro is not the Thai bot, and it's, you know, it's been melting like a glacier. In, during a climate crisis for a while too. So, I mean, these are not minor currencies. And the yen, um, uh, these people actually are also our ally. And if things break here, there, isn't it going to cost the Fed more to come and be a lender of last resort to foreign countries? Or you think they're just going to let them go down? No, they're going to let, they're not going to let them go down. They would create some kind of as I said, emergency concoct, concoct a few more things. They're gonna they're <laughs> gonna find a way to keep markets liquid without without okay. looking like they're bailing them out. I think. But to okay. your point, I heard on Bloomberg this morning that the ten year JGB hasn't traded for for three days. Oh my god! I didn't know that. Yeah, which is Boy, they're keeping impressive, wow. you know, fact, and it shows what? you. You have market. to make an appointment <laughs> exactly. to get a trade-off, Pedro. Let's see. I'll see uh, you, JGB, next Tuesday at 9 o'clock. Exactly. To you liquidate a bond. 
you would think that the government bond market would be happening 24 hours a day, right? But yeah, it's yeah, and the yen is yen is also approaching um, its intervention levels that uh, we had over 145. We got to 590, and today, uh, last night, got to 586. Will BOJ come in with another 1% of their reserves and try and stop it? Um, do you think they're putting out phone calls to other central banks? Uh, we have helped the Japanese before um, and have been successful at times with turning the end. I think the, the, the BOJ would probably appreciate, and the, the, the Japanese finance ministry would probably appreciate some help from Treasury, but it's unlikely to get it because Getting the dollar higher is part of the inflation fight. In fact, the, you know, the, my colleague yeah. Tim Cooper argues that the Fed has this whole time the Fed has an unspoken strong dollar policy where he's, okay. you know, they're actively trying to strengthen the dollar. So, I don't think they want to quite undo that with the strength that a market intervention would, you know, okay. would lead to. One, so of the a, one of the interesting twists to me is that people were thinking of financial stability as potentially leading the Fed to pivot, right? But it could actually lead to a longer lag between now and the Fed pivot, because if the Fed has to intervene with financial stability issues, it might take a hit to its credibility, right? To its inflation fighting credibility, which might lead to inflation expectations becoming somewhat unanchored, which would then lead the Fed to have to react on the inflation front further down the line and therefore prolong the inflation problem. Uh, which would mean that they they'd have less leeway to to eventually pivot and cut rates. So, so I mean, really, how can the Fed compete with OPEC cutting back two million barrels a day? Uh, isn't it? I mean, it's a supply issue. Uh, how are how are Fed funds at four and a half going to resolve that? No, they can't, and that's been the problem with fighting this inflation the whole time. The a lot of this inflation is a supply issue over which the Fed right. has no control. So all it can do is, you know wreck the economy essentially in order to to get supply and demand back in balance but that not in a positive way in a sort of it's a crushing demand in order to get it down to levels uh that are matching a challenged supply picture so it's not it's not a good outcome yeah because wasn't it um volker it was more of a demand problem except for the um embargo the opec uh, oil embargo that's right. And the argument, the argument that Fed officials make today is that the Volcker inflation started from a period where we'd already had kind of 10 years of inflation edging higher and therefore people already expected inflation to be built into the system. Unions negotiated for wages based on that expectation of inflation. And so they see themselves as lucky for having entered this period when the expectations are not so out of hand. And, and that's what makes them at least argue that there is a case for a potential soft landing is that if expectations are not out of control, that gives them time to, to bring inflation down a little less drastically, but it's not looking right. great. Yeah. So uh, full full steam ahead for the Fed, uh, despite uh, some of this malfunctions in uh, global markets in Japan and, and uh, UK and probably Europe. Uh, you see any risks? Uh, um, with what's happening to have some counterparty risks here in the U.S. with uh, some of these banks looking, let's talk Credit Suisse. Um, yeah. What What do you think of that situation? Well, I think that was that's what convinced me that we were in a new financial crisis period. Like when we went from the Bank of England concerns to Credit Suisse within the same week, okay. that was just that that took me straight back to covering 2007 and 2008, where it was like a Lehman. You know, Every time you turn the page and you, you, you turn a corner, there's a new major risk factor out there. And the exposures and linkages, to your point, are widespread, as you know. The U.S. and the European financial systems, the economies might be fairly insulated from one another, especially the U.S. economy vis-a-vis -vis Europe, but the financial system is not. And, and to the point that I was making earlier, they've kind of hyper-regulated the banking sector post Dodd-Frank, but allowed you know the leverage to go into the less regulated parts of the system. And we really don't know where that game of whack-a-mole is gonna pop, you know, rear its head. And that's, those are the risks that they're paying. Okay, so being a veteran of uh, previous financial crises, 
what are you really paying attention to going forward, Pedro, to see if this is going to be, let's use a Bernanke term, contained? So, uh, since he won the Nobel Peace Prize, let's give him uh, kudos for contained. So uh, two things. I think the main one of the main risks is Treasury market liquidity, which has been challenged for various reasons, including the size of the market, the size of the Fed's presence in the market. And that's, of course, what forced the Fed to intervene in March 2020. And they would certainly do so again. Uh, and that would put them in a really tight Bank of England like spot of having to do a little bit of QE on the side while at the same time trying to do QT. And I'm not sure how, how long they could hold that inconsistency. And the other spot is really credit spreads, because I think that even though the Fed talks about financial conditions broadly, what they really worry about, what really keeps them up at night is the potential for, you know, kind of cascading corporate defaults if we were to enter a deeper recession. So I think if, if credit spreads really blew out, uh, then that might be significant for the Fed. When you ask me about full steam ahead, I think it is full steam ahead for now. They are getting to the point. I think that one of, one of the reasons the market is trying to guess the pivot timing as well is that the Fed has given us some forward guidance that it's going to get to four and a half percent. And just mathematically, that means, you know, yeah, we're, we're 75 there. and one more 50. Right. But the right. big question is, they also had previously given us guidance that rates were going to peak at 1.9 and then they were going to peak at 2.8 and then they were going to peak at 3.8. So the question is whether you believe that 4.6 and whether you believe that inflation is going to cooperate enough between now and early next year to give them cover to slow the pace of hikes. And that's a big question still. So. Well, uh, you talk about them maintaining their credibility on the fight of inflation. I think this is, you know, like the sands in the hourglass. This is the last, you know, I think the last chance they have. Was, was I reading something correctly that uh, there is some type of um, institution that if they felt the Fed was not doing their job for financial stability that could step in and, um, you know, do something uh, that is outside of the Fed's purvey? Not other than Congress. I mean, okay. Congress is the boss of the Fed. So okay. the only institution that could step in in the Fed's, you know, in lieu of the Fed would be would be Congress. And of course, Congress did do, did do so last time with TARP, right? TARP was, right. A, was a bank bailout that was fiscal in nature because it came from the Treasury. And so that would be sort of the extreme step. Okay, uh, well, to, to the point about credibility, and I see some of the notes here in the chat about about the, the rich point about the Fed taking a hit to its credibility. And that point is well taken because I think that, you know, the Fed talked about front loading and the reason they're doing 75 basis points is that they're front loading. That might have been the case if they started with 75, right? But they actually started with 25 yeah. then they went up in March, then they went up to 50 in May. So they're actually playing catch up. And I think, you know, I'm, I, I've argued recently that the fact that they're going in 75 basis point increments is already an admission of a policy error. People think of the yeah. policy error as being in the future, like the Fed's going to over tighten and cause a recession. Right. But the they were slow error, here too. Yeah, it was by, it's, by, it's the lack of reaction to inflation that is forcing them to act in an almost emergency type manner. And we've gotten used to 75, but these are emergency style moves, right? They're just like one step short of an intermediate emergency hike. So, um, okay. Adults of reality for our audience here today, Pedro, that um, although, you know, trick or treat, Halloween and the holidays are here, there are some stresses and uh, people have to be good stewards and shepherds of their capital for their families. Uh, during this time that we may be in an environment where return of equity is more important than return on equity. Absolutely. And and not to mention year end kind of funding stresses take place anyway, right? And in this environment, they're likely to be supercharged. So I am concerned okay. about what liquidity might look like in, in treasuries come come the holidays. Okay. Can we wrap it with uh, your view on the CBDC? You know, I don't have a particular view, to be honest. I mean, I have a view on, on the likelihood that it will get off the ground. 
Okay, I hear, what's that? I would love to hear your take on it. Um, my take is that it's not going to get off the ground anytime in the near future. Um, Great news. That the Fed, <laughs> you know, the, the Fed floats it because it's sort of a, it's, um, you know, it's, it's trendy. trendy. Yeah, it's well, I, I mean, didn't President Biden sign some executive order to move forward with doing it? That's right. That's right. Okay. But I think we're still so far away from actual, you know, realization of it. And when you hear, I think Powell was on a panel the other day with the Bank, Bank of France, and there was various, like, there was the head of the BIS and, and Lagarde was on it. And they talk about it so much more concretely in Europe than, than we do here. Like Powell talks about it like it's in the very beginning, exploratory phases, and and Lagarde talks about it in much more, more concrete terms. So my sense is that, and I've heard folks like Neil Kashkari and others at the Fed talk about, we don't understand what, what the problem is that CBDCs are trying to solve. So that I sounds agree. to me like it's not really something that they're keen on doing. Okay. All right, well, I- And I tend to that. agree. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand the problem that it's trying to solve. Kashkari yeah. made a funny point about like he made a really he was on a panel the other day and he was saying that he, he challenges people every time like tell me a, a transaction that you could not have made without without you know the digital a, the digital right. And, right. and and the only the only example that he could find was when somebody was trying to like smuggle arms into Ukraine to help on the, to help the war and they could only buy weapons with Bitcoin and he's like okay if you want to be an arms dealer then maybe Bitcoin is the one for you but. Okay. Otherwise, uh, there's no particular use. So. Well, we know what a, what a powerful lobby they are. <laughs> so uh, it's great news. I'll sleep better. Pedro, thanks so much for uh, being here again and, you know, uh, giving us, uh, you know, giving us what you see and not sugarcoating it. And uh, re really appreciate your views. Uh, you bring a lot of credibility to the table. And I want to show our audience where they could find you and other great writings for a resource at MNI. And Pedro's a columnist there and does some great stuff with Fed governors and former Fed people. And uh, you're a watchman for people when it comes to um, trying to understand an opaque institution like that's tr trying to be transparent but their transparency confuses most people absolutely i try my best i, I like to say that I, nobody grows up dreaming they're going to be a fed reporter but i did <laughs> my, my only professional aspiration was that i wanted to be kind of at the center of, of policy action i you didn't are. think i didn't think guesstimating the level of rates was going to be it but here we are. That's where the that's where the action is. So. It is. It is. Especially now, the way the the all the ranges, the daily average trading range on notes never used to be like this. Absolutely. Even in the heyday. So Pedro de Costa, everybody, thank you, Pedro, very much. I'll talk. To, let's get back together in the winter, that and see great. see how things are developing then. That okay. Thanks. All right, moment. Pedro de Costa, everyone, follow him on Twitter at p da costa p da costa you got it p and also costa. check out check out my podcast which is called fed speak available okay. on spotify and itunes oh okay uh, it's All also right. it's also in the market news website and there's a you know if you if you're a market news subscriber you get the podcast uh you get the podcast uh five yeah, days you're there. the rest of the world so yeah there okay it is. yeah if you, right. if you click on that click on that real quick because then we can show you the range of, I guess you can't see it there, but let me just, like in the last two months, we've had two or three sitting Fed officials, two or three research directors, like really high quality people. I actually have a, a podcast today coming out with Olivier Blanchard, former IMF chief economist. So look out for that. All right, Pedro, with his ear to the ground and uh, that things are shaky. First time I've heard you talk like this, Pedro. So uh, thank you very much for sharing your candid views with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Dale. All right, buddy. So that's a wrap, everyone. You could join the team in 20 minutes on the Morning Edge. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings, and be a good steward in this time. And take care, shepherd your resources, and only take managed risk. Managed. Adios, everyone. Bye, guys. See you, Pedro.
Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.